minutes. If you have not followed his Triple H Horse Racing Podcast, you're missing out. It's one of the best podcasts in the country. Good evening and welcome to episode 348 of Picks and Ponies right here on the HHH Racing Podcast. I'm your proud host, Howard Kravitz. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We are so excited. We're going to be talking about two big topics. The first, Illinois Derby Day this Sunday. It's back. The Illinois Derby this Sunday at Hawthorne Racecourse. And Jim Miller will be on here in just a few minutes to talk with me about that. And then Pete and Paul, my wonderful co-host, will be joining me a little bit later in the show to talk about early Kentucky Derby pace scenarios. It's time to talk about the Derby in details now that we've a pretty good idea of the field. So we're reversing the schedule a little bit tonight. Please make sure you're with us. We'd love to have you on for the whole hour and 15 minutes approximately. You can, of course, reach me on X right there at H Kravitz, scrolling at the bottom of the screen by email, hkravitzhorse at gmail.com. Uh, excuse me, at gmail.com, yes. And please make sure you hit the subscribe button on the bottom right-hand side of the screen if you're on YouTube. And also, if you're on YouTube, smash that like button below the video player. And also, if you're on YouTube, on the top right-hand corner, please hit that notification bell so that you know when new content will arise. And our X handle has gone way up with our follows. We, we'd love to have you watching the show live, replays at any time. But if you are watching the show live on X, you might want to go over to our YouTube page because that way you can follow us in the live chat. You can put in some comments. Just go to the YouTube, YouTube and in the search bar, type in HHH Racing Podcast and the show will pop right up. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor. Uh, now, Derby preview shows. Wow. I counted 14. That's right. We have 14 shows lined up, over 15 hours of coverage for this year's Kentucky Derby weekend. And the best place to go to find out about more details other than an email that I will be sending out is to our website. If you simply go to our website, let me take that down. You go to our website. This is our main page. And you just scroll down the main page. You can see our current lineups. There's our, cur our current lineups for this week. If you keep scrolling down, there you go. You see our Derby and Oaks coverage. There is our show for tonight. We've got a long shot show. We've got a fantasy draft, which is going to be a lot of fun next Tuesday. How about should we hedge or should we not hedge on our big Sierra Leone future bet? Uh, we're going to have a Derby and Oaks roundtable as well. Top 10 horses, and then we'll get into the previews. Anyway, check it all out. It's on our website. Just scroll down the uh, front page of our website, and you can find out all the information that you need. We really hope that you're going to be watching and listening to the HHH Racing Podcast in the next two-plus weeks because we are going to be busy. It is a full-court press right here on the pod. Please subscribe to our Power Picks. Look below the video player for information on our Power Picks tip sheet. We are not upcharging for the Oaks and Derby. It's $4. That's it. $4 for several pages for the Oaks and the Derby. Please subscribe right now. Again, look below the video player. You can find sign out a sign up on Patreon. It's the best deal around. And again, there's no separate charge for the Oaks and Derby. What are you waiting for? Please make sure you sign up. And, of course, about our website, we just talked about that, hhhracingpodcast.com. All right, we got a lot to talk about, a lot of things to do. Um, I want We'll talk about the Hawthorne contest. I'm all geared up. I got all my new gear. All my merch came in. This is my brand-new HHH Racing Podcast quarter zip. I love it. Jim Miller, I'm sporting the Hawthorne hat. Let's rock and roll. Let's bring on, for our first half of the show, the director of racing, who does yeoman's work and is very excited about this week, director of racing, author and race course, Mr. Jim Miller. Jim, it's Illinois Derby week, man. I've been waiting to say that for a long time. How are you doing? It's been a long time. You think about it. It's been six years since we've been able to say that for the Illinois Derby. So I'm happy it's back on the racing calendar. Howard, before we jump into Hawthorne, though, first off, I want to congratulate you. You had yourself a pretty good weekend last weekend, huh, my friend? I had a pretty good weekend at Keeneland. It was very exciting. Uh, 
top 10 finish in both the spring challenge and Friday and the grade one gamble on Saturday. But Jim, as I said, I gave a, a bit of an emotional speech on Saturday night to our group. I don't know if you saw uh, on X, but there's a picture of everyone that, that Justin uh, Sampson sent out, but man, just to, you know, when you, when you win a decent chunk of change, that's nice. But as you know, the money comes and goes, it's all about family and relationships yep. and people you're around and just to be able to do it on that kind of stage with our big group around me was, uh, was very cool. So thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that's a little precursor for me to yeah. Sunday because I'm coming in hot gym with two entries. I'm not going to lie. I'll just tell everyone right now, chance of me doing well, who knows? It's going to be a really tough, uh, a, a tough group, a tough field, but uh, thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Well, and I'll tell you, when you get things rolling in that, it, it, things do go kind of in spurts. So you had a really good weekend last week. It, it could very easily roll over to this weekend too. Good handicappers are good handicappers. You follow that trend. We talked to Matt Miller time and again. Every once in a while, things don't necessarily go your way. But when they do go your way, you have to kind of stick with that plan. And when you do so, you're going to have a lot of success. It paid off for you last weekend. Definitely could this weekend, too. It, it is. It's a great contest format, and it's a uh, it's a good card. And uh, we can definitely talk in depth about the uh, Illinois Derby and kind of how everything came together or didn't come together. Because as director of racing, I'll definitely happily give you all those details as well so uh when we get to that we will talk about that but first off contest wise again congratulations and i'm excited we're hosting the contest and doing it on sunday because so many people focus on the saturday cards sunday contest hawthorne will be the focus this should be a really good contest too well there it is before we talk about it another gym another fantastic gym jim goodman just want to shout out him again yep. i know you know him does a great job with contests and many other player development a lot of wagering a lot of things at keeneland so the gyms know how to uh do their jobs at racetracks jim miller it's on the screen man not only the highlight of the day of course is the two hundred thousand dollar illinois derby on sunday but we've we talked about this contest. I hope you've had a lot yeah. of entries. I've not signed up yet. I will be doing that, I think, through Hawthorne Racecourse dot com is how I'm gonna do it. Please talk about the contest Sunday that is online, which is right. unusual for the Hawthorne contest. You gotta take advantage. Zero entry fee whatsoever. Your money that you're paying in this contest all goes into your bankroll. And and the thing about this contest, Howard, that that's really cool is Anybody watching this podcast who has an express bet account can play as well. It's presented by, by first bet. It's our partnership. We are trying to grow not only the Illinois Derby, but the signal at Hawthorne as well. And handles been up throughout the course of the meet. We've kept that low takeout 12% win play show takeout. So much more money back into the pockets of the betters. But with this contest, like you said, there's two ways you can play. You can be on site at Hawthorne race course on Sunday, or you can play through expressbet.com. You see, it's an $800 bankroll with no entry fee. So you put that $800 in, everything you make off that $800, you get to keep. It's a contest format where it's on Hawthorne races. You see, win, play, show, exact on daily double. And the way the contest is, is working kind of from the back forward. At the Illinois Derby, it's the last race of the contest. That's race number eight on the card. You have to bet a minimum of $200 on that race. You have to bet at least a minimum of $100 on four other Hawthorne races. And then with that remaining $200, you can kind of work amongst other races if you want or put it all into a single race. So it's a nice contest format. Again, keep what you make. That's the thing that's really important about this. So you could have a good day. And even if you don't win, you're still taking all that money home with your bankroll. But you see the $10,000 cash, NHC, Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge entries. Really, it's a cool setup. If you want to see the rules or get any of the details, go to the website, HawthorneRacecourse.com, and they're all right there. I think Mark Bogas says it best on the bottom of the screen, Jim. Tonight, we start the rebirth of Hawthorne Racecourse and Illinois Racing, hoping everyone supports Hawthorne this week. And I know you'll push back a little bit. Uh, Hawthorne Racing's been around for a while, but certainly when you have big days like this, it does bring a lot more attention to yeah. Hawthorne. Sylvain is also here. Sylvain, if you're listening. I've got your merch, man. I know you've been waiting for it for a long time. And he, Sylvain lives in Canada, okay. uh, so it'll be shipped up to Canada, Sylvain, very soon. I'll talk to you about that through an email. Terry Frank has a question yep. for you, Jim. Wasn't the Illinois Derby a prep race for the Kentucky Derby years ago? Uh, it was a prep race for the Kentucky Derby. and It was one of those things when the point system came into, into place, the Illinois Derby was kind of worked out of the point system. And then what happened was we had kind of repositioned it as a prep for the Preakness at that time. 
And then, as everybody knows, racing in Illinois got very muddy for a little bit. We we went from five tracks in northern Illinois with Maywood and Balmoral Park on the harness end, Arlington Park, Sportsman's Park, and Hawthorne on the thoroughbred end to just one track. So because of that, it's one of those things where we're still there. We're still battling. We have thoroughbred racing. We have harness racing. But we wanted to focus on those horsemen who are racing with us day in and day out. So the Illinois Derby left the calendar for a while. It's back on the calendar now. We're doing really good. Great support from our horsemen as well, too. But it's nice to start to build that stakes program back. And this is going to be the first stakes of what looks to be a good stakes season as well. Yeah, for sure. War Emblem, was just mentioned, was the winner of the Illinois yep. Derby. Went on to win the Kentucky Derby. Uh, let's just We're, we're going to get into contests, but just while I see it, yep. uh, there. let me take this down, Jim. While I do see it here, before I forget, there's a question from Jeff Amster. Yes. Jim, just for clarification, do you have to bet $100 on four of the first seven races and then bet 200 on the eighth race, the Derby? So you have to pick at least four of the first seven races and bet a minimum of $100 on those on any of four of those races. So there's going to be three other races within those first seven that you have 200 to play with. So that's one of the things where you can kind of work around for those other three races for how you want to place your money. And then in the Illinois Derby, you have to bet a minimum of 200. If your bank rolls more and you've, and you've done more and you like the race even more, you can bet more than 200, but you have to make sure you hold on to 200 in your account so you can bet that at a minimum on the Illinois Derby and work from there. But there are some people that like to play doubles. I know Matt Miller is a big double player. You have some people that like to play exacto, so they may play a little bit more on exactos, but it's a minimum of 100 on four other races. If you want to go over 100 on those four races, you can. You just have to make sure you hold on to $200 for the Illinois Derby. Okay, Jim, so I hope that clarifies everything for everyone. We're going to talk about contest contest strategy yep. tonight as we go through some of the races. Now, just let everyone know, if you're wondering, what, what happened to Pete? What happened to Paul? <laughs> they will be here. They're going to be here at approximately, as we're filming live here on Thursday night, they're going to be here about 20 minutes, around 8.30 Eastern, and all four of us, excuse me, all four of us, yes, long day, Jim, all four of us are going to go through the Illinois Derby together and then uh, we'll let Jim go a little bit later on. So that we're again, we're switching around our our format a little bit tonight. Jim, let's we're gonna here's what we're gonna do for everyone. We're gonna do yep. handicap races five, six, seven, and eight. Now, the reason why we're doing that, folks, is that's the last four races on Sunday in the contest. There is a race Sunday, race nine. However, the Illinois Derby contest ends on the Illinois Derby. So we are not gonna talk about race nine which is the finale on Sunday, other than the fact we're going to give our, everyone our late pick four, which will include, of course, race nine. So we don't want to be uh, too confusing. Let's get right into race five. Again, this is the last four races of the contest. And remember, everyone listening and watching, this is the Sunday card. Again, the Illinois Derby is this Sunday. I love the idea. All the attention on the country will be on that race. Here's our ticker on the bottom of the screen. There's race five, and let me go ahead and bring up the uh, entries for race five on Sunday. It is a starter. It's about uh, 432 Central. Starter, optional claiming 13.5 down to 7.5. They're going a mile and 70 yards. It's a field of eight. Pretty heavy morning line favorite in the number two gun rush for Watkins and Centeno. Jim, you're going 3-2-4. I'm going 2-3-5. And for people that don't know, you do make the morning line. Yep. We want full disclosure yep. on that. So you're going to go with a horse that you put at five to one, a Minnesota bred that I have in second, Jim. So I mentioned this horse too. <laughs> Cousin Vinny uh, is a Canuck. I love yeah, Cousin Vinny is a Canuck. Yep. What do you like about the three, Jim? All right. So, so the thing that's interesting, and first off, Howard, like you mentioned, for those watching for us for the first time, yes, I do make the morning line. The morning line is how I see the betting public wagering the race so it's not necessarily how i personally handicap the race but that's what i see the horses going off at uh when when the gates open Correct. so looking at this field here's the thing about it gun rush can show speed but wicked surprise and hot dame both can show speed too so you get the three horse because vinnie's a canuck this is a horse that raced at this level in that last out had the 10 hole in that spot actually found a decent spot early on and was able to run on late, and that was behind a pace that wasn't overly fast early on. The winner took him from gate to wire from the outside draw. You were coming in off a little bit of a layoff into that spot, but the way things might set up ahead of Kuzvini's a Canuck 
might be perfect. It could be three horses battling out there on the front end. The weather looks like it's going to be nice on Sunday, around 60 degrees, dry, so you will have a fast track. This is a track that's played very evenly throughout the course of the Me Too. And I think a horse like Kazvini is a Canuck in the second start since being claimed, second start over the racetrack this meet, might just get the right pace set up. And when you're looking for a little bit of a price in a contest, you're going to get a little bit more value in this spot. Now, full full disclosure again, I have two yep. entries. And I'm look, Jim, I'm not afraid to give my opinions here on the show. I'm not going to hide anything. I'm not going to, you know, detour tonight to, you know, fool people. That's not what I'm about. People know what I'm about by now. Um, I'm not going to say I'm going to disclose every single bet I'm going to make. But I will say this. There are no trifectas in this contest. Right. So you're going to have to be selective with your money and your exactas. And I agree with you, although I do have gun rush on top just because, look, he looks like he's the best speed and, and he could certainly wire the field. But you make an interesting point. Wicked surprise from the inside is not nearly as good, but could show some speed. And there is one horse to the outside that you mentioned that I think really could hot dame. mess yep. up the works, which is Hot Dame. In fact, I think the whole key to this race is Hot Dame. I yep. don't think Hot Dame can win. But Hot Dame can really mess up the works for the number two. So the break is going to be huge. I think Arietta has to send from the outside. It's a relatively yeah. short run into the turn. And I agree with you. I think the three is a nice alternative if you want to beat the favorite here. Yeah, and, and I don't know if because Vinny's a Canuck is good enough to defeat Gunrush because Gunrush has yep. been exceptional over this Hawthorne strip. Winner of five of six. You look through speed figures alone. Gunrush is probably the fastest horse. It just yep. comes down to trip, but this is a horse that I'll tell you has raced really well for trainer Jim Watkins. Jim Watkins is the president of the HBPA down at Fairmont Park, but he splits the stable between Fairmont and Hawthorne because there's certain horses that just fit this Hawthorne racetrack, Gunrush being one of them. But this horse put together an exceptional string of races last year. Wasn't quite as good with the move over to the synthetic, so kind of tailed off a little bit, so kind of has to turn it back on. Maybe you catch him once. And that might be it. And then after that, he may just put together another uh, string of victories, too. I mean, the horse is five out of six at Hawthorne with yep. one second. He loves the track. Uh, a lot of people are going to play doubles, you know, into this horse and with this horse going forward. I've got a weird feeling, Jim, that gun rush might be the whole key to the contest Could in be. a weird way. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's going to be very interesting. That is race five on Sunday. Let's go to race six on Sunday. There's our picks on the bottom of the screen as I bring it up right now on the screen. Race six is a $5,000 claim where they're going five and a half furlongs. Nice field of nine. It's a very tough morning line here to make. The yep. morning line favorite you have is the number eight time heist, the California bred for Rodriguez and Giles at five to two. And we are both going with the favorite yeah on top in this race. What do you like about time heist, Jim? We, it looks like we see things very much the same way in this race, Howard, and, and it really revolves around the outside three horses. Again, it's just kind of a pace makes the race type of thing. Uh, robust on the far outside is going to show speed, but time heist last race, that was a really strong close because it was five-eighths of a mile. It's, it's one of those where it's a little bit shorter run into that first turn. You don't have a ton of ground to make up and a ton of time to do it. And Time Heist was a horse that, when you watch this replay, really kind of came from out of nowhere. This is a horse that was on the uh, near the outside in that spot. But Time Heist just kind of settled back. Giles was very patient. But yes. when you look in the lane, Risky Boy, who was in this spot, Bourbon Teddy, who was in this spot, were both out there just kind of pushing things along. And Time Heist just really got the trip more than anything else. Because this one, you, you sit back and you see this is a horse that's at the back of the pack right now. Right here, Chip, it's like, horse. Yeah. this horse is going nowhere. Like, I was watching this replay. I have to admit, I didn't see this race live. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. But I'm like, this is either the most confident ride I've ever seen, or this horse has nothing, and it was the former, not the latter. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you, too, I mean, it, and I've watched our chart caller call charts. I, this horse was further back than even the lengths that the chart caller gave this mm -hmm. horse credit for. This horse is probably eight or nine lengths back. And you see the horse is on the wrong lead for a little bit here in the lane, but still trying hard. And then when the horse switches leads, everything just kind of takes off. But you see him battling up there on the front end. And this horse doesn't give up at any time and really doesn't even want to switch leads, Boom, as you right see there. there. Yep. yep. And and then all of a Boy. sudden, just it's it's another <laughs> gear. But that was at five-eighths of a mile. You're going a sixteenth of a mile further now. And I think Time Heist gets a very similar setup because not only is Bourbon Teddy in, back in there, Risky Boy's in there, but Robust now on the far outside, who also has speed, is in there. 
I think it's, yeah. again, three horses duking it out, and this one just gets the perfect trip. It, it, it does feel that way. I'm, I'm in general against the horses coming out of the time heist race other than him because he just blew yep. by that field. And so, you know, that's why, it, you know, it's going to be interesting. I've got what I do have the seven in second, but I mean, he showed speed. I think the nine could be interesting yep. if he clears off the claim, I guess, you know, I've got him in third, but time heist to me looks tough. Again, just hard to trust closers at this distance, Jim, but he just did it so well. You know, it's hard to argue with him. Yeah, and you, you'll see when we get to my pick four ticket, that's the one horse that I really kind of felt the most confident about over the course of this sequence was time heist. Again, it's just the added distance. It scares you a little bit, though, Howard, when a horse doesn't necessarily want to switch leads. The other thing that scares you a little bit, if you really want to dive deep, look back to last April. This horse was claimed last April the 9th. That claim was voided by the vet. So the vet didn't like something that they saw in the detention bar. And after that race, it was required some time off from the horse. But again, raced well coming back. So the thing is, time heist just kind of figures it out. It's a seven-year-old gelding that tries hard and uh, should be pretty tough to beat in this spot. Jim, we got a ton of people watching on YouTube on yep. X. Again, if you're playing in the contest every on Sunday and you believe in what myself and Jim are saying, get get your pens, get your pencils out, get that notepad and start taking notes. You might totally disagree with our opinions, but I'd like to think our opinions are going to be pretty sound, at least with some good reasoning. And then it's up to you, of course, to make those bets at home. Let's go to race seven, Jim. This is the race before the Illinois Derby. Now let's talk about this for a second. Let's talk yeah. contest strategy for a second. All right. The Illinois Derby has uh, six horses this year, and that is the last race of the contest. So let's say you're playing in contest, Jim. Let's say you're an astute, uh, you know, player and you're an experienced contest player as you're very well familiar with these type of events. Would you recommend people hold some powder and save it for the Illinois Derby? Or would you have a feeling based on maybe the smaller field in the Derby that the race before the Derby actually might be the time to send it in and set yourself up for the Illinois Derby. It's going to be very interesting to see what the top players do on Sunday with that situation. I think you play it, the strategy in three different ways. First off, you, ha you have to make this one of your $100 races, only for the fact that it's a bigger field, a chance to catch some, uh, some value in there, and a chance to cash the ticket. The next thing you do, because you get a constant updated leaderboard, a lot of people are watching the leaderboard. I think it would be a wise move to play a double in this race into the Illinois Derby because that's the money that's tied up with wagers that people don't know what the result's going to be because it doesn't come up until after the Illinois Derby. So then you're going to go into the Derby, hopefully having a live double ticket into that race, knowing what the scoreboard is after race seven, aside from anybody with daily double plays, and then you can determine what you want to do in the Illinois Derby. I think, honestly, probably to win the contest, You'll have to play more than that $200 minimum wager in the Illinois Derby. But if you have a good feel in the race, and there's a couple horses that I that I like quite a bit in that spot, I think you have the potential to go ahead and do it, play that way, and then cash pretty nicely. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what people do. Tanner Hawkins is in the chat. Hello, Tanner. How you doing, buddy? A little late, but good evening. It's never, never too late to join us, Tanner. I, I'm just going to – I'll just say tell the world right now, Jim. I'm going to be firing pretty heavy into the race before the Derby. Um, yeah. If things go well for me, and who knows, I'd like to have a nice four-digit score going into the Illinois Derby, which will give me some flexibility. And one of the range reasons, I think it's going to hard. It's going to be hard to find a lot of value in the Illinois Derby only because it's a bit of a smallish field, and there's no mm -hmm. tries, of course. But there's no tries in the entire contest, so I'm not afraid to say, Jim, that I'll be firing heavy before the Illinois Derby and then hope to have some powder in the Illinois Derby. We'll see. I, I think, Jim, you'll know right away. If you look at the leaderboard, I mean, you'll have plenty of things to do on Sunday. But you either see me at zeros after race seven or hopefully a nice total. I doubt it's going to be something middling. I can tell you that right now. So we'll see what happens, Jim. But let's go to race seven right now as I bring it up on the screen. Jim, you might have frozen up a little bit unless you're very still. Up oh, Now I think you're good. Okay. A little let's bit. go to race yeah, seven. I'm back now. Yep. All right, race seven. Very quickly, just about five minutes, Jim, and then we'll bring on Pete and Paul. Race seven, like you said, a nice allowance field of nine with a pretty heavy morning line favorite, the number one. Richie's on a roll. Illinois bred for Giles Rodriguez, nine to five morning line. I think he's probably going to be less than that on yep. 
Sunday. Let's go ahead and bring up our picks right now. Give me one second as I'm sort of going all over the place here. Picks for <laughs> no race worries. seven. There they are. There's our picks for race seven. Guess what, Jim? We are both going to try to beat the one. How about that? You're going two, one, three. I'm going six, one, three. You're going twirling roses. This is, uh, there's three Rodriguez. This is, I'm sorry, I don't know his first name. Is that Eddie? Or Eduardo. 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 Yep. I apologize. You're Eduardo good. Rodriguez has got two. He's got the and two Jose. and the three. Twirling Roses is a closer. Phillipsburg is speed. Very interesting there with those two horses. Uncoupled. Chris Amy. Great to see him back at, at Hawthorne. Six to one morning line, Jim. What do you like about Twirling Roses in the penultimate race before the Illinois Derby? First off, if, if you don't mind, can we start with the one horse, Richie's on a roll? Of course. Richie's on a roll was a horse that was a big topic of conversation. And here's the reason why he was a big topic of conversation. Richie's on a roll won a claiming crown race. And the claiming crown produced a very nice return for this horse. You see 122000 in earnings last year for Richie's on a roll. So some of the jock agents came in after this race was drawn and said, hey, this horse isn't eligible. He won the claiming crown. Well, the race is for three-year-olds and up, now winners of 10,000 once other than maiden claiming starter or state bread. The one thing about the claiming crown is those are really rich, expensive starter allowance races. So when you go yeah. back and look at the chart, then that's what it was. This was a starter allowance, just a really expensive one. And we even called other jurisdictions to get verification on how they would determine it as well, too. So, yes, Richie's on a roll. Winning a claiming crown race still makes the horse eligible for this spot because it counts as a starter race. But looking at this race, Howard, the two Eduardo Rodriguez horses are the reason I went to the two twirling roses because he also has the three Phillipsburg in this spot. There's a couple horses with speed. And with Phillipsburg being a horse that shows speed, as you see right there, this is one of the horses that could keep Richie's on a roll honest because Richie's on a roll. Yep. It's really a one run type of horse. Typically gun it out there, go play a game and catch me if you can. As you see through a lot of those recent races, it's either it's forwardly placed or close. The race, even in the claiming crown, they went really fast up front. But here from the inside, I think he's going to have to go. So because of that, you get to twirling roses, the two horse. This horse loves this Hawthorne track. Look at the record over the racetrack. Very solid. Seven victories, 12 of 18 on the board. Was running on nicely late in that last out. Now you get an eighth of a mile further. And I just think everything lines up for this horse. Chris Amy, a strong finisher in the saddle. Good value in here. You have the potential of a short favorite. And I think this is a race where you might be able to maybe beat the favorite. And if you can, I think Richie's on a roll is one of those horses that could do so. I, I agree. I will push back on one thing. I'm not sure Richie's on a roll has to have the lead to win, but it's definitely sure. better on the lead. I don't sure. think there's any doubt about that. And you'd have to believe they, they were gearing up for that grade three. I, I have a hard time believing they are gearing up, you know, for this allowance spot. Right. So that's another thing. And the source is coming back quick. I mean, there's a lot of days. questions for me here, Jim, and I agree with you completely. I'm going to try to beat this horse. It might be the end of my contest. If the one <laughs> wins, I might be out. I, I You know, it's very possible. But I, I don't know. There's something about this horse that I don't trust on Sunday. And I have the same kind of idea with Silent Sunday, who I don't know, Jim, if this horse can handle the dirt. Although I will say he was racing on dirt early in his career. I know those are Los Al thousand yard races, but he ran perfectly fine, you know, at the California Fairs last year, yep. too. So look, he's in good form. I respect Bill Morey's a trainer. If he can handle the dirt. I, I think he's the same kind of horse as the two here. So we're yeah. thinking along the same lines. I put the three and third only because, you know, maybe the speed will hold and maybe Richie's on a roll won't run. The two I would use also. It's really, Jim, a very interesting race before the Illinois Derby. And similar yeah. to the number two that we talked about in the first leg, Gun Pilot, if the one loses there, that changes the entire complexion of the contest. Would you agree with that? And that's the thing. And you have to look for value if you really want to cash in these contests. You need to only beat a couple of favorites here or there. And there are some vulnerable favorites who are going to be very short prices too. So I think yep. there is the potential to try to uh, pull off that little bit of an upset and cash a nice big uh, ticket. Absolutely. Jim, I am so proud to now say, let's discuss the Illinois Derby 2024. And I cannot think of two better people to do that with and my wonderful co-host first 
from the East Coast of Maryland, Mr. Pete Visco, and the Saratoga Special, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Mr. Paul Halloran. Guys, welcome to the Illinois Derby Day preview. How are you doing today? Wonderful. Hey, Jim. All right, hey, guys. Hey, Jim. Hey. All right, guys. Illinois Derby. Very exciting. It's race eight. The four of us are going to discuss it. And then we're going to, after that, Jim and I will give our late pick four picks for Sunday. For everyone watching, I do have everyone's picks. And let's put them right now on the screen. Scrolling on the bottom of the screen is everyone's picks for the Illinois Derby. And I'll tell you what, Jim. You are out on a ledge, sir, because I love right. that my top pick isn't on any of your tickets, sir. <laughs> if you, oh, we'll have to talk about it. If you're right, myself, Pete, and Paul are going to be absolutely wrong. When the director of racing has a pick that none of us have in the top three, I get a little nervous. So I love to hear from Jim Miller. Yeah, I, no kidding, Paul. I'd love to hear about it. Let's take a look at the field, guys, for yep. the Illinois Derby right now. It's first of all, just before six o'clock Central Standard Time, a mile and an eighth. $200,000 is the purse. Of course, restricted three-year-olds. It's a little bit of a smaller field. I'll let Jim expound on that a little sure. bit if he'd like to. Yeah. The more line favorite Jim Miller has put is on the number four, Woodcourt. Five to two, Contreras and Esquivel. It's a very well-balanced field. There's definitely some talent in this field. Jim, before we talk about the analysis, as director <laughs> of racing, I'm sure some people would like to know why isn't there a bigger field? I know you guys worked your ass off, excuse my language, of getting horses in there. Uh, the horses that are there are certainly quality. They've been along the Derby Trail. Uh, explain a little bit. You told me before the show, you thought there'd be more, and then something happened the morning of, and just the way it is. Well, we were upwards of eight, even nine runners in the race going into the morning of, and it was one of those where you had some trainers, for example. Brad Cox was looking around amongst different horses. He had nominated 11 to the race. And then just the morning of decided, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to hold off. We had another trainer who was on their way and then decided, no, we're going to go to the Pat Day Mile. And then we had another trainer who, again, was just making the determination if they wanted to wheel back quickly coming out of the bluegrass. And the morning of it was, oh, let me call my owners. And then the owner said, oh, no, we're going to wait. So when you sit there and you have kind of the potential for – your bigger field, and then it all comes down to the morning of, especially when you have 40-plus nominations. It's real hard, and it's tough on the stakes coordinator because we're very honest with our horsemen. So when they ask, okay, who are you expecting, uh, you tell them, okay, these these are the names we're expecting, and some people make decisions around that. So came down to what it was, and, and I'll tell you, credit to Larry Ravelli. We were actually at five for some time. And Ravelli decided to go in with Ravenstown at the last second. I mean, and this is a guy with Larry Ravelli. This horse just ran a week ago. He's helping us out because he's local for one, and I give him all the credit in the world. Uh, at the same time, Larry's helped us in the past before, and he's won races doing so. So he's a very legitimate trainer, and he knows what he's doing. But uh, that horse could actually have a very big impact in the race, at least from the pace scenario end of things. No doubt. And Jim, not just saying this because you're on the show and sponsor us, but listen, you you did yeoman's work as long as well as your assistants and everyone to try to get this field. I mean, Pete and Paul, it's a two hundred thousand dollar race for a mile and an eighth. It's a long stretch and it's an auto -quali qualifier to the preakness. There's only so much Hawthorne can do, guys. Uh, and if, if people don't want to go, it sort of feels to me like races in California, Paul, where everyone's afraid of Baffert. I mean, there's there's money out there on the line and just people just decided to pass in general. We're just going to celebrate the horses that are there, Paul and Pete. Yeah, well, I think it's tough. You know, uh, Brad Cox, Jim says, has 11 nominated. I'm sure they had to figure, well, we're going to get one of them, right? But, yep. you know, let's face it, Brad doesn't run there regularly. And, you know, it's not like you have the same amount of leverage as you might have, I would think, Jim, with, you know, someone who does run in the circuit, you know, who might be more inclined uh you know, to send someone and look, all you can do is get yourself to that morning. And it just sounds to me, and this is the first time I'm hearing it, it sounds to me like everything that could have gone wrong on entry day pretty much <laughs> did go wrong. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, hey, that's the way it goes. Uh, someone's walking out of here with 120,000. So <laughs> hats off to those who, uh, who, who stayed in. Absolutely. Let's get, let's get to the race guys. We're going to go from top to bottom really quick. We'll talk about the race. You got Real Men Violin for Kenny McPeak at 3-1. to one, And Relu Gutierrez coming in to ride. 
Patriot Spirit for Michael Campbell, his Illinois connections, obviously Melon Patch Incorporated ownership at four to one. Ragel, and I saw your write up, Jim. You can talk about the history with Brennan Walsh at some point in this race with uh, Morales with blinkers on at six to one. There's the more line favorite, Woodcourt, five to two, Cipriano uh, Contreras, uh, Esquivel takes the mount coming in from two graded stake efforts. Then you have the Grease, who obviously is very polarizing. It's Jim's top choice. None of us have this horse in the top three for uh, Jared Loveberry and Al Stahl. And then, of course, there's Ravenstown for Ravelli, who definitely will show speed for sure with Mojica. All right, let's go with the picks and the analysis. Jim's going 5-4-2. I'm going 1-3-4. Paul is going 1-3-4. And Pete is going 4-3-1. Jim, as the director of Racing and Hawthorne, I'd be remiss if I didn't let you go first. You're going to go with the horse that none of us have in our three, La Grease, Triple Crown nominated, 7-2, uh, finished ninth last time in the rush away, but only lost by three lengths. You'd figure this horse will be closing and will love the long stretch at the Cicero Oval. I love that Jared Loveberry rides too. And, and Al Stahl is familiar with the Illinois Derby. He won the Illinois Derby in the past in 2013 with Departing. And Departing had himself a pretty good career. This is a horse that I don't think they were really sure what they wanted to do with early on. I mean, they debuted at Saratoga. It was a really good effort on debut. And they debuted going long. So you definitely know that was the intention. A couple of turf tries were both pretty good. And then they stay in in that race that came off turf in New Orleans. And that was the big, big effort. And that's what put me on this horse because the style in that race and the slop was a perfect trick, right? Just off the pace and then look to take over in the lane and run on late. And I thought the race in the rush away actually wasn't that bad. It's a ninth place effort. You're beating only three lengths when all was said and done. Hung a little bit wide in that spot too. And I just think it was a little bit better than even it looks on paper the horse was giving credit for. I just think too, Hawthorne's a tough track to ride. It's a long stretch. It's tight turns. Jocks like Ray Lou Gutierrez and Edgar Morales don't ride Hawthorne regularly. And these are guys that a lot of times you see that move is that wide move at the 3 8 pole. And then all of a sudden you're empty at the 16th pole. You really have to bide your time, wait all the way till the lane, and then look to make your move. I just see Loveberry tucking this horse right in behind the pace, waiting till the stretch, trying to go through on the inside. And if he can and the horse is good enough, maybe you catch a little bit of a price. So here's the question, Pete, and I'm assuming this is why the three of us don't love this horse, but I don't want to, you know, uh, speak for either one of you guys. Pete, this horse has two races on the dirt. Now they are on the fast dirt, excuse me. They were both last year as a two-year-old. Neither one of them had a very good fig. The fig two back was in the slop. Pete, is it something other than you're concerned about fast dirt, or is that your main concern with Legrese? Uh, there were <clears throat> that was one. There were two things that because if you look at the breeding too on the sire and dam side, both sort of were preferential to wet dirt. So I figured maybe the if the if the sloppy track moved this horse forward against what we always say off the turf fields are usually a little softer when they get to the dirt. Obviously, you yeah. usually get turf horses. And then the other thing was the three best races on the on the board here, we're all with Lasix. Now we're off Lasix. So the combination of maybe preferential to the wet and being off Lasix was enough to me because I already have the five to two favorite. If I can get away from the seven to two shot yeah. then and go for somebody else, then I'm going to look to do that, especially in a small field. Paul, very quickly, your thoughts on Legris. I know you don't have in the top um, three, and then I'll give my opinion or piggyback on either one of you. Are they similar to Pete's concerns, Paul? Yeah, it was mostly the dirt. You know, it was just the one start on fast dirt at Churchill. Uh, granted, it was a second career start, so maybe we shouldn't be so hard on him, uh, especially with Al Stahl saddling him. But um, I, I just uh, – <laughs> when I took my first glance at the race, uh, I always gravitated toward uh, our friend Ray Lou, and, and then I handicapped the race a little bit and – I, I just uh, like the the one a lot. I, I owe Jim a lot here, though, because the fact that he likes the five will prevent me from doing something probably silly with the one because <laughs> I uh, obviously respect his opinion a lot more than my own at Hawthorne. But uh, yeah, I, I I just I did think the uh, the the dirt is a question mark. You know, not saying he can't run on it, but 
I looked at the fact I looked at four horses possibly winning the race. Uh, I knew exactly when I saw the Ravelli entrant. Jim didn't have to say what he said. I knew exactly that Larry did them a favor. This horse has no chance, but God love him for putting them in. Yeah. Uh, I like when the local guys support the stakes races. So I, I looked at one of the four, one, three, four, five, and I, I just think the one is sitting the right trip here, especially with that Ravelli horse in. Well, let's talk about the one, Paul. You and I have this one on on top. Uh, Relu's coming in, which does mean something to me. I do realize, Jim, that that is a bit of a disadvantage for not knowing the track. But look, I'm sure he'll do his homework necessary for a race like this. I watched the Louisiana Derby, Paul. I couldn't really find an excuse. I don't know what you felt like. I did think the horse was used a little bit more early than he likes to be. And then there's a point where... He was in a little bit tight, but I'm being nitpicky. I will say this, Paul, and I'm sure you saw this. He lost. He finished 11th and lost by 47. Lannery wrapped up mid-stretch. I mean, so forget about the number. I mean, he could have, okay, he wasn't winning, but he could have finished ninth by 15 or something. I mean, he just completely wrapped up. He didn't run great two back, though, in the Risen Star, so... I do have my concerns, but if you go back to his form in the fall of last year, Paul, to me, this horse, I won't say towers, but is a very likely winner. He's been working well at Churchill, two very good works. Uh, we do have a little bit of intel that those works seem to be good. And I believe Raylu was on the work the last time. So if he can find his form, to me, this is a likely winner in a field that I don't see any superstars in here, Paul. Yeah, and, and, you know, I'm big on company lines and just the horses that are on the page for the last two races, yeah. uh, the first, second, and third, you know, granted he lost by a million likes, but I'm just saying any six of those horses, in my opinion, is a prohibitive favorite in this race, including the uh, eventual Derby champ. I don't know if you guys heard, but Sierra Leone is going to win the Kentucky Derby. Okay. And he ran with Sierra Leone two races back. So, uh, okay. and the, the, the second to Anna Marie, uh, you know, who may, may have a punch's chance <laughs> in the Derby. It does, looks pretty good. So, yeah, I, and, and I, you know, Ray Lou was won the, uh, the title at Fairgrounds, which has one of the longest stretches yes. <laughs> in the free world. So I, I have ultimate confidence in, in uh, my friend Ray Lou to, to get this job done. And, uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see what the numbers show, but uh, that that's going to be my pick uh, today and on Sunday. I agree. Pete and Jim, I'll let you talk about the four in just a minute. But, Jim, let me just push back at you. You don't have the one anywhere. What is your concern? Is this just the, he's, his form is just so bad that you just can't go with him? You're trying to look for more value. Talk, what's your opinion on, on real men violin here? Yeah, I think the horse could be there. It's just one of those things where I'm curious to see kind of how the pace scenario is and if the horse can turn things around a little bit off those last couple. I agree completely that Lannery just wrapped up in the stretch in that last out. It was the race two back in the Risen Star, and maybe it was the slot more than anything, but I was actually expecting a little bit more kick in the lane in that spot, and the horse yeah. didn't go on in that race. So that was the only thing is you're coming off the Kentucky Jockey Club, which was a really good race going into Risen Star, and then you see almost a little bit of regression more than anything, and then you got what you got in, in the Louisiana Derby. That was my only concern and the reason I stayed away. I do like the – these two works are very solid. I didn't see them, but it just – I don't know, Jim and, and Pete and Paul. It feels like there's some intent here that McPeak's just – okay, they're, they're starting the clock over, and this is sort of a good place to regather. I could be wrong. Maybe it's wishful thinking. Pete, let's go talk about the four. Woodcourt, the Moorline favor. This is your top choice. Jim has him second. Paul and I are a bit more negative to Woodcourt. Five to two. I thought he ran very solid at Oakland and the Rebel, Pete, all at 44 to one. But I also thought he got a pretty comfortable trip. It was from the 12 hole. He did have to be used. Last time, ran perfectly fine. I don't really know if he's a sin horse. Um, he, he can certainly win this race without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, I when I w went through the race, there was no one I loved. So as I'm going through it, it's more lesser of many evils at some point. So what I liked about this one, there is, if you look at the time form, which we didn't do necessarily, but there is I'll potential. We yeah. talked about it, the six from the outside, the, I forget which numbers. Yeah, you'll, you'll bring it up, but there was some 
the six from the outside, I thought the two and three, I didn't think the six had as much of a pace advantage as say time form was giving it, but I felt like there's enough pace up front and the six, I don't really trust. So if the six goes a little quick, if he gets pressured, then we can get maybe a little bit of speed, enough speed to, I think, let the four just sort of sit off. It's a six horse field. So he's not going to be too far back. So even like three back when he closed, in that optional claimer at Oaklawn, he closed from, from pretty far back. I don't think he's going to have to do that here just yeah. because the field's going to be so condensed. And I'm looking at it going, I, I want the, the horse that I think is the best closer potentially. I don't love the one very much. Uh, again, it was a lesser of six evils yeah. for me to go, to go with the four just because nobody jumped out, but I went, let me go pace instead of maybe pure talent in the end. Well, Jim, maybe the Woodcourt's just maybe Woodcourt's yep. better, you know, um, coming from a little bit further back. Maybe they felt in the last two the connections felt like they need to be up closer, which hindered his late kick. Maybe Woodcourt will be a little further back, like he was, you know, three, four back, and and make that run. The only problem with that, Jim, is if he does that, isn't he making a similar run with the one and the five? So I think this is a very interesting jockey's race, Jim. It, oh, it definitely becomes a jockey's race, and it, it usually becomes more of a rider's race when you get a shorter field. Uh, Manny Esquivel started his career at Hawthorne, so he knows the track yeah. very well. Cipriano Contreras was a longtime assistant trainer to Mike Rivas, who's trained on the Chicago circuit forever. He knows this track very well, and this is a guy that wins at a 25% clip. He spots his horse as well. He has a good idea. He claimed this horse for 50000 and that race in the Rebel, I thought, was an excellent race. You had the 12 hole in that spot, found good position early on. I think they probably even had to work to get that position. But then the horse did run on in the lane and battled in that spot. And the Jeff Ruby stakes, I didn't think, was a bad effort by any means. But I think this horse is a little bit better on the dirt as well. I like those couple of starts. And look at those races. The two races at Oakland, it's the 11 hole and the 12 hole. Those are really yeah. tough spots. Shorter field, should get decent position. I think they're only sitting maybe three, four, five lengths off the early pace of Ravenstown, and maybe I think they get the jump on a horse like Real Men Violin in here. Let's quickly talk about the two and three guys, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up with Jim. And Jim, you and I will show our yep. late pick four tickets for Sunday. Let's talk about the two. I looked at this two real carefully. Patriot Spirit, uh, last time against Beeline, a very talented horse, was, was sitting in behind very comfortably – my issue with the two, Jim, is I'm not sure about the distance. I know he's yep. by constitution, which you'd think the distance is going to be fine. To me, if he was all that, you know, if he was the bee's knees, I would have liked to see more punch in the stretch in the Gulfstream race and a big gallop out. I just didn't see it. That being said, the source is nicely bred, has upside. I just, to go from six to a mile and eight to me, Jim, is a very big ask. Uh, he, that's the thing. He's bred to run all day, but just hasn't done it in those pair yeah. of races. I mean, the, the mile of Churchill's one turn, that race at Tampa is a two turn race. Tampa can be a little bit of a quirky racetrack as well, but this horse won at Tampa while sprinting. So the thing about Patriot spirit to me is, is I just tend to wonder, and I concern, I'm concerned a little bit that this is a horse that goes out and pushes things a little bit on the front end with the stretch and distance as well. But again, yep. you have a trainer who's trained on the Chicago circuit for some time, a rider who's a local rider. I'm sure he's going to trust in Julio Felix positionally. Their best shot is going to be to try to rate back a little bit, but I just don't know if the horse wants to do it around two turns. I got a feeling this is a hard send, and if if he outbreaks the six, he'll be on the lead. If not, he'll be sitting right off uh, Ravelli's horse. Now, the three, to me, is fascinating. If I were to go with a, a long shot in this race, to me, it's the three, Regal. Uh, I realize he looks slower, and people say, well, he hasn't really faced some of the other you know, better horses. You know, change of command is pretty good, and, and rattled off a few. And Conquest Warrior was, what, the second or third choice against Fierceness. So, you know, maybe those horses haven't panned out for the Derby. He's got blinkers on. I have mad respect for Bl Brennan Walsh. He's been the distance. I just have a feeling... Jim, Pete, and Paul, we're going to see a major move up with Regal. This is my second choice. Paul and Pete, you have him second also. Paul, what do you think about Regal quickly? I'll get Pete's opinion, Jim's quick opinion, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Yeah, I think uh, I think the race might play to Regal, to your point, Howard. I, I'm looking for Regal to be not sitting right on top of the pace in this race, but mm -hmm. more uh, coming coming late uh 
I don't think uh, I, I don't think he'll uh, beat the one. But I, I do think that uh, I look at this race as three horses who are really going to press it, and then three who are going to sit back. Uh, I used all three that are going to sit back, so you know I, I could run fourth, fifth, and sixth and look like an idiot. But that's happened before, so that's not going to come as any shock to anyone. But no, I I, I do agree with you. Uh, you, you know uh, the horse is proven at the distance, which is one thing I liked. And you know Jim mentioned the two stretching out. You know Ravelli's horses obviously stretching out three and a half for a long stretch out. I mean, I think Larry Ravelli is great. If Larry, Jim, if you haven't already done it, if Ravelli wins this race, can you start work on the statue immediately <laughs> after the race? At yeah. least oh, one yeah. he'll, statue, he'll have maybe one. two. Maybe yeah, two. He'll, he'll, he'll but, have one just for running in the race for us. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, Pete and but, Jim, any, any other comments about Regal, either one of you? Pete and Jim. Uh, I was just going to, the only question I had was the, the addition of blinkers. Cause usually yep. we equate that with maybe adding a little more focus. And I don't know if that's going to ingest speed, which I wouldn't want to happen. If I like the three, I agree where I, I think I like this horse just maybe sitting a bit off, but maybe the blinkers are more just from a focus thing and not necessarily to push the horse forward. I don't know, Jim, what do you, what do you, you think about that? that, Jim? I, I mean, I, I kind of agree with you for that spot. That was a concern for me with Regal, just for the fact that there are some others that are going to show speed. If it's a focus thing, I mean, you see the last two times the horse ran, just kind of ran evenly in the lane. Uh, Brennan Walsh, he likes the Illinois Derby as well. The last time it was run in 2017, he was the winning trainer with Multiplier. So knows this racetrack, kind of knows the preparation to go for it, and uh, I could see him being in the mix as well. And Howard Brendan, remember, was not afraid to add blinkers to pretty mischievous before the Oaks last year. That's an excellent. And that point. was the and, and that was for the for that reason. The, How did that work out for kinda, her? How did that work out? Uh, it worked out well. It worked out well. <laughs> yeah, it sure did. Uh, Jim, it's going to be a really interesting race, man. I, I'm I'm yeah. very excited. It's going to be a jockey's race. It's the last race of the contest. It's just going to be very exciting to see what happens. I think it's for a small field, it's pretty wide open really. So it's really going to be uh, interesting. Jim, let's go ahead and talk about our pick fours here very quickly. Again, now the pick four we're showing and Pete and Paul just hang tight, which we're just going to talk very briefly. The pick fours we're showing are start with race six. These are, this is the last, the, the last four races on Sunday. And Jim, we're not really going to, let me take yep. this down. We're not really going to talk about it. We'll let's just show it and read it off. Jim's going singling the eight. That was time heist, correct, Jim? Yep, eight correct. with one, two, three, six, with one, two, four, five, with one, three, four, five, seven. That's a $40 play. Again, that is the late pick four on Sunday, which includes race nine, which is outside of the contest. My pick four is a $32 play. I'm going seven, eight with one, two, three, six, with one, three, with one, three, four, five. We're both pretty spray in the last race, a $32 play for me. Jim, just everyone did notice again, Jim's going four deep in the Illinois Derby, one, two, four, five. I'm going two deep in my pick four, one, three. Jim, before we let you go, uh, any other final thoughts? Any of the fans need to know uh, who's going to the track, Sunday? I know you have some nice hospitality for people that are going to be at the track contest players. Just any final thoughts? for a huge weekend of Hawthorne coming up. Uh, just a couple of things for the players. One, if you're a contest player, we're offering a nice buffet up in the sportsbook area for anybody playing the contest. It's always a great atmosphere. Way to come out there and uh, go out there and look at the racetrack. We're moving our pre-race show right down outside of the contest area. So if they are coming out, feel free to come by and say hello. And then the other thing for players that I find to be really important for a better we do not change the way we maintain our track just because it's a big day. We're not looking for times. We're not looking for speed. We're not looking for anything like that. We're, what you see is what you get for how Hawthorne plays. It's played very evenly, very consistently throughout the course of the meet. That's exactly how we're going to treat the track going into uh, Illinois Derby Day. Expect a track without any bias and expect that to, uh, to hopefully play to maybe a few upsets here and there too. Uh, look, it's going to be a great day. I'm very excited. Jim, I know you got a long week. You've been on for a while. You're all right tonight. Thank you very much, my friend. I, I'm sure I'll see you uh, at the track on Sunday. Myself and sure. Kyle Roscoe will be representing the HHH Racing Podcast with Buffet in hand and our merch as well. Jim Miller, Director of Racing Hawthorne. Thanks, my friend. We'll see you on Good Sunday. Good luck, Jim. Good luck. This it, guys. See you, Paul. See you, Pete. See Take you. care. Bye-bye, Jim. All right, Jim Miller, awesome job from Jim. Look forward to seeing him on Sunday. Guys, we got about 
20 minutes or so. And Pete, I know you've got a, a family, uh, some issue to uh, attend to, uh, you know, so if we go beyond uh, 915 Eastern, feel free just to go ahead and, and step away. Will this do. is sort of the unofficial beginning, ladies and gentlemen, of our 2024 Kentucky Derby preview shows. And Pete, I mentioned it already. Let's bring it up one more time because we have a lot of people on that weren't on earlier in the day. I've got a new banner that I uh, posted because, look, we got to promote it, uh, Pete and Paul. You guys are going to be very busy uh, the next two weeks, but but for good for good reason. And there we go. Kentucky Derby preview shows. Go to our website, hhhracingpodcast.com. Pete manages that basically, does a great job with it. Full sh- uh, schedule and show times, Pete. I won't go into detail. I already did that earlier in the show. There's about 14 – uh, shows we have right now, including a possible, that's right, Paul, you'll be all good. You'll be good, Paul. A possible live show. We don't, we're not, we don't want to guarantee anything. Uh, we're going to have a, a tons of analysis. We're going to do a lot of fun stuff like fantasy draft and a whole bunch of things. Go to our website. It's on the main page. Just scroll down. I showed it at the beginning of the show. Please make sure you do so. Guys, today's just going to be a tertiary, just a quick look at possible pace scenario in the Derby. And unbeknownst to you guys, I've got some banners with some questions. I thought instead of just sort of going off the cuff, I have five questions I'd like to surround our conversation around. Now, I also have the general PPs on the other screen that I'll show. So we'll bring up some PPs of the horses that are probably going to be in the Derby. I do not have time for U.S. early pace right now. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to talk about specific analytics. This is just more our general thoughts and and preconceived notions based on what we've seen. We're not going to be throwing out specific, you know, numbers based on Aquabase or or time form in terms of this horse as a X early pace rating, etc. First question, Pete and Paul. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Did you want to say something there? No, I just wanted to see when this derby stuff is over, if Pete wanted to go with me and try to get a job at a Nike sweatshop in China to get a break. I I feel like I'm building iPhones or something, Paul. I don't know what's going on. Wow. Okay. You know. By the way, we do what we do. I love it. I don't know if you guys got a quarter zip. I love the feel of it, really. I have a quarter zip. I do. I I just – I can't – I I came home with the little – I did some shopping last weekend, Howard. All right. Some I, extra I see. shopping last weekend. I would have, but the line was like out the door and I wasn't gonna wait like for Well, you gotta go. That's see, time. that's a rookie that's a rookie move. I know uh, I should have gone. A trinket pro I like myself goes in the first day he's at the track. You go in in the morning, you don't try to go at the end of the car, you know. Well, I can work with you on that. Some of us have like are, are, aren't as privileged as you and actually have to teach the children of America. And hey, look, I was slaving. Right. I was working the whole time I was there. Just asked Leslie Dorman. I kept reminding her of it. Uh-huh. All right. Here we go. Question number one, guys, on the bottom of the screen for Pete and Paul. They don't know these questions. I'll address this to you first, Pete. Yes. How much do the post positions matter in your assessment of the race flow of the Kentucky Derby? A lot in the Derby. I think it is probably one of the key things because what we know about the pace in the Derby is we don't know anything about the pace in the Derby because it's such a wild card. So depending on where your post is, if if you get a horse who has a little bit of speed, who's on the inside, they need to go or else they're just going to get bombarded with a wave of horses. If you're way on the outside and you're a speed horse, you probably have to go because you can't get hung wide and sit mid pack. So I think where the speed horses specifically are located is going to be vital to how the pace sets up. Before you answer, Paul, first of all, Terry Frank, Terry Frank, who lives in St. Louis, what are you waiting for, Terry? I'll host you, man. Just give me a call. You got my number, I believe, or email me, Terry. I'll host you. Fly up for the contest. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, I can't remember. So I'm just going to go to Paul because I, oh, if you guys want to talk about a horse specifically, I do have it on the other screen. So if you just want to bring up any horse, we can talk about that. Paul, post positions, how much does it matter? Well, I think it matters. I agree with Pete. And I think it matters primarily because there are 20 of them. So, you know, depending upon, you know, you could draw a bad post in an eight horse field and say, okay, I can navigate that. You know, I look at a horse like Fierceness, you know, who probably has the best chance to run second to the Derby champ, Sierra Leone. And, you know, if that horse draws inside whatsoever, um, you know, that that would be, I think, a huge disadvantage. I look at a horse like Dornock, who they tried rating last time just to see how it would go. 
uh, it went horrifically, and they're they're going back. So you know the horses like that. Uh, what what I think is interesting, Pete, is in this, and we'll talk about it more over the course of the next three hundred and eleven shows. Uh, what I think is interesting is that it seems to me like the horses that I think are going to be forward are the better horses in the field. So uh, we will see what the post positions bring. But, yes, to answer your question, Uncle, I do think it matters. No, Funny, I, 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 I kind of disagree with that, but I will, we'll get to it. Okay. Only because I, I, I don't like the speed horses aside from Fiercest. I think the rest of them – have no chance of winning, which I enjoy, wow. and wow. no, not in a not in a, in a in a negative way. It's just I don't like, like who, if we talk door knock, track phantom, to. Oh, Password. I don't like them, Pete. No, I agree. I don't like them at all. But on paper, you're, those are the horses that are going to take. True, money. true. Sorry, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, right. I should have said it like that. They're not garbage horses. Like they're not just junk speed. They're good horses. I just don't right. think they could win. Yeah, you're right. Okay. We got to bring up the Derby background, by the way. A little, a little late, a little lane game, church off in background. Always fail. Everybody's I, looking I remember at what our, I was our say, faces. Guys. Nobody cares about them. They're looking at our pretty faces oh, at the well, background. Your pretty face. That well, oh, anyway. true. I was just yeah. trying to be nice. I really no, love my own and Paul's, obviously. <laughs> That's very nice. That's very nice, you, Pete. As always, <laughs> thinking about others, Pete. Visco. I do. I do. Um, I'm mag magnanimous <laughs> like that. I, do, I remember what I want to say. Everyone down below the video player. We got a lot of people watching on YouTube. We don't get enough comments down below the video player. And, you know, that's not your fault. That's my fault, everyone at home. So down below the video player, two things I'd love to hear you from. Number one, who do you believe will have the lead at the first quarter of the Kentucky Derby? And number two, who do you like in the Illinois Derby? So please put some comments down below the chat. Your Illinois Derby pick and then who you believe will be the leader at the first quarter of the race for the uh, on the Kentucky Derby in a few weeks from now. All right, let's get to the next. Well, actually, I didn't answer the question. I think it does matter quite a bit. Um, obviously, if you're on the inside, you're forced to go. I know Paul will have much to say about the dreaded rail, where it's supposedly it's not as bad as it used to be. I think Paul Halloran sort of disagrees with that. And there is a absolute math, because I'm a math teacher, the 20 hole is not nearly as much ground loss as people think. In fact, I don't, I don't, I don't want to give a number, but it's like, literally like 15 feet of ground loss. It's like five yards, it's almost nothing. It has to do with something called the Pythagorean theorem. But we can talk about that later when we have Mr. Kravitz's mathematical lesson for the uh, Kentucky Derby. Paul can't wait yeah, for I'm that. I'm going to miss that show. I think I'm sick that day. <laughs> Next question. Which horse or horses can only win if they're on the lead or sitting just off it? Paul. Uh, Doorknock, uh, Encino, uh, Track Phantom. I'm going through my PPs. Just a touch here. or no? You just on the a screen, touch. Paul. I've got some PPs on the screen. If yeah, you'd like. yeah, I, that's what I have in front of me, is what you have. Okay, uh, those would be my top. Uh, you know, I think uh, resilience has been forward in his races, but will not be that forward, uh, in this race. So uh, those would be uh, my top candidates for horses who really need okay. to be right around it. Doesn't West Saratoga have to be four or two? Um, I would say yes. Um, okay. You know, again, I'm really happy for a guy like Larry Demerit to have a horse in the Derby. This horse has no shot, whether yeah. he's forward, backward, or in between. Pete, your thoughts on what horses absolutely have? To, where where does fierceness have to be? Well, I, I mean, was just going to say, I the only one the missing story, was fierceness. Right? I mean, to me, I don't think fierceness can be far off. I think fierceness. He, I if I was a fierceness fan, I would want fierceness on the lead if possible, as long as it wasn't okay. suicidal. And then, but I don't think he can. I don't see him sitting in sixth or seventh or eighth no. and closing. So I think fierceness is probably. The top one, because I think out of the horses that Paul named, I think Fierceness is the only one who could actually win the race, you know, within logical reason. Obviously, anyone can win, as we've mm -hmm. seen. Yeah, I think Fierce just has to be comfortable, right? This notion that he has yeah. to be on the lead, I don't agree with that. He wasn't on the lead in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, so... I just think he has to be comfortable. But if he's on the inside, chances of it being less comfortable are certainly higher than if he's on the outside. We got a lot of great comments in the chat from Open, whoops, Open NYD. Derby needs to limit the field of 14 horses. Hmm. 20 is too many. What do you guys think, Paul? You know, 
I, I think in theory that would be probably best, but you know it's been twenty for so long now, and and in, in, in U.S. racing, it is such you know so important for people to run in it, let alone win it. That I I don't see it going back, and you know at least they're now all in the same starting gate, which was a you know a, a huge step in the right direction. So you know in an ideal world, yes, but I don't think it's realistic. So I would say no. Uh, Paul B said that he thinks the leader will be in Sino at the first quarter. That would shock me, frankly, but we'll, we'll see. Well, we be- don't we don't know that Encino is running yet, Howard. We do not. Are you telling us that you've got? No, I, I have no, no, I have no, uh, no, no, no. Uh, although I right. perhaps might make an inquiry before the next uh, 311 shows. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying, you know, remember, they're not going to run uh, just for the sake of running. Although we, we do, we did hear last Saturday, Howard, that, in that very impressive trophy room we were in, there is a big one missing, and it's there the is. Kentucky Derby. So they'd love to win it, but uh, I think they're going to talk to Brad about you know, you know what is best for this horse at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I would guess they're going to run. I do uh, agree with you though. I don't think he'll be on the lead, but certainly we think has to be forward though, right? Yes, I would think so. I've got three more questions. Pete, if you can stay for all three, great. If not, that's absolutely no problem. Paul and I can finish up. Next question. Your best guess, assuming a fast track, of the first quarter and half mile splits. Pete, you want to throw some numbers out there? Oh, man. I'm not good with, with, the, with the splits, but I'll go, I'll go 23 and then – I was going to say 45 and change. Ooh. I think, I think people go crazy, man. People no, <laughs> they just want to hear your name in the lead, right? How many owners just well, want to give the damn horse on the lead? That's true. But also I think it's they, the, the, even the jockeys who've run in this race a million times, you get nervous because you know, you have a horse that needs to be, if you have any shot of winning, you know, when your horse needs to be close and you're going to do whatever you can to get there. And sometimes they go a little crazy. We all know you let the horse a little bit too loose. They get out of hand. They go a little too fast. They get a little competitive. I think, and, and that's what I hope for, because a lot of the horses I like, including the one we all have a wager on, are going to be coming from the back. So yeah. that's what I'm hoping for. So maybe that's just more wishful thinking than, than yeah. logic. Well, you're actually leading into my, another question. Paul, that whole first quarter is just the first run, right? I mean, that, that first quarter of time will flash basically as they start that first, you know, as they start the clubhouse turn. And then, of course, the half mile is, you know, on the backstretch. What do you think, Paul? Just guesstimate. I know it's we don't even know the field. We don't but we have a pretty good idea yeah, at this point. What do you think? I'm thinking maybe like 23 and 46. Yeah, I think like 22 and 4 and like 46 and 2. I think we're all in the same yeah, 46 kind of, and I don't one, think it's going to be blazing, but I think it's going to be honest. I just have a very hard time believing it's not going to be honest. And, you know, the interesting thing about this race, guys, is that if Fierce's brakes well is up there, it's going to be interesting to see how many horses feel they need to go after him a little bit to soften him up, or did you just, like, take back and just hope for second or third, right? So there's a lot of intent here um, if Fierceness is on the lead. Obviously, we hope someone presses him, but – Unfortunately, I wouldn't be shocked if, if Fierce goes the lead. People take back a little bit thinking, okay, you know, this horse is a monster. I'll be happy with the second or third place finish, like a track phantom or a door knock. I don't think that's going to happen for the record. I do think someone other than Fierce will have the lead at, at the first quarter. That's just my opinion, but we'll just have to see. Uh, and, and Paul, uh, Pete, this next question sort of leads up to what you said. Does Sierra Leone or Catching Freedom, who we believe are probably the two best closers in the race, at least most people feel that way, need a fast pace up front in order to win this year's Derby? Pete? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you always need, just because depending upon where you are and depending upon post and everything, they're going to need some pace. I don't think it needs to be like the Rich Strike year pace. I don't think it needs to be suicidal. I just think it needs to be better than honest. I think it needs to have some pace. And again, with closers, we know Sierra Leone catching freedom, those kind of horses on a Marie, they're going to need trip too. So you're going to need the combination of pace and trip. So I need, yeah, I agree. We're going to need pace, but we're also going to need trip. 
Um, Paul B said, "If fear, if it rains, fiercest wins by 15. <laughs> okay, I would like to have some action. Can we have a private chat bedroom, please? On, <laughs> on these, these ridiculous. I, 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 I want to hear. I mean, I love our viewers, but that's just silly. Sierra yeah, Leone. Paul, did we little, little Sierra little. Leone slop races? Don't make me start a rant in the middle of the show, for Christ's sake." <laughs> What's your thought on the question on the bottom, uh, Paul? I think honest. I would replace the word fast with honest. And one thing I yeah. think is going to happen in this race, Howard, I your scenario about people holding back and wanting to run second or third, I don't really think that comes into play in the Kentucky Derby. I think everyone wants to win the Derby. And yeah. I think the key to this pace is as much how many horses are contesting it as how fast they are going. You know, the old Richie Migliori uh, uh, saying, or is it Tony Black? It's not how fast you're going. It's how you're going fast, Yeah. right? And I think that we need, those of us who are looking at a big closer, I, I think we obviously need a trip, as Pete points out. But I think we need there to be an honest pace contested by three or four horses and everything will be fine. I got to say, I agree with Mark. I don't think Sierra needs even an honest pace. I mean – he can move earlier if he needs to, and he's proven he's closed into slower paces. I mean, I don't want them dawdling, obviously, but they're not going to be dawdling. I So I agree with you guys in general, although I'd push back slightly with Sierra Leone just because I think he can go when Tyler wants him to go. And so we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. It's going to yeah, be. Yeah, but it, if, it, if it's the, the problem is you can go and you just don't get there. That's the, the problem when it's a yeah. slow enough pace because it's you have to navigate so many, and we've seen him right. not break well. So if he's navigating because he's stuck behind horses, yes. it's not like you're just going to go clear and just get a straight run. Unfortunately, that happens, but it doesn't happen as much as you would hope if you have closers. That's, I think, the problem. So you want I them backing up a little. So I think the pace helps with that, I guess. I think there's two things that's happened the last few weeks that are underrated. Number one, door knock, thankfully for us or me or whatever, not running well rating because they have to go. Door knock has to go hard. It's his only chance to win this race. I don't care if he's in the 20 guys or if he's in the two. Door knock has to go. The other thing, track fan, who I don't think wants any part of 10 for, nine furlongs, let alone 10 furlongs, has blinkers on. And Asperson has not won this race before. You think this horse is going to sit in behind fierceness all comfortably and say, go ahead, take the lead. I'll just sit there and go by you in the stretch going 10 furlongs. No freaking way. Track Phantom is going, guys. I'd be shocked if he doesn't go. So those are two. You can, you can debate the, their quality. But of the speed horses, guys, those are two pretty high quality horses that to me absolutely have to go. And the last thing I'll add, and then we have one more question again, Pete feel free to leave when you need to, is the fact that Brad Cox has two main horses. He's got Catching Freedom, who's a closer. Who's his other one? Just a Touch. I'm not saying Just a Touch is going to be in there to set it up, because Just a Touch is a quality animal, but they've got to, you've got to believe Just a Touch is going to be forward, guys, right, to at least help set up for Catching Freedom if that arises. So those three, I don't know if you guys have thoughts on any of those three things. I don't think that's wishful thinking. I think that's Halfway decent analysis. That's just that's my opinion, guys. I Any agree with all that. that. No, I agree with all of it. Actually, well, yeah, sorry. I agree. You are you are known for your halfway decent analysis, and you're right I, on time. Look, it's better than bad analysis. Pete, we got one more question. You want to say goodbye to the group, or you want to stay on? No, I'll, I'll check there? one question out, and then I'll skip. Let me all see right. the last one. All right, we'll make it five minutes. No, this is the last question right here, and we'll get we'll we'll finish the show. Last question, guys. Where is the most likely winner, <clears throat> Sierra Leone, of the Derby going to be at the first quarter mark in this year's running? And I'll say, like, you know, the, the lead towards the front, mid-pack, you know, two-thirds back, back of the pack. You guys can use whatever terminology you'd like. Pete, I'll let you go first. Where, And you don't have to give the winner, but just in general, right, if you think it's going to be a fast pace, the winner's going to come from way back. If you think more moderate, then it's going to be more up front, right? So in general, where's the winner of the Derby going to come from? I think the winner is going to come from the back third, most likely, unless it's Fierceness. I think Fierceness is the only horse that could be up close and win logically. I think every other horse that at least I like or think is a really logical case to win will be potentially in that back third of the field. Paul? 14th. 
not giving a specific number. I like it. Yeah, I've wow. given it some thought. Really? And hmm. I'm assuming you believe that's Sierra Leone, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's about right. This thought that he's going to be like 18th or 19th, I just, I don't, I don't think so. It is funny, he's though, because you do say that every week, funny. and every time he runs, you say that, and he's basically in last every race, but it's okay. <laughs> One of these days, he'll prove he wasn't Pete, the I'll have you know that. Good pack in the Risen Star, right? Not the first. Yeah, at the Risen Star, he was seventh out of twelve at the half mile. Oh, at the half. The, yeah, at the half. Yeah. Oh there yeah. We well, yeah. No, ninth out. Of, ninth out of twelve yeah. in the Risen Star, Pete. Ninth yeah. out of twelve. Yeah. And again, where uh, where he is uh, will have something to say about this. You know, I think Howard and I agree. I want to see him. Oh God, nowhere inside of number ten. And and I don't want to hear this. Well, the way he runs, it doesn't matter. That's a bunch of bullshit. Because you've got 19 horses coming down on you, it matters. I, I want this guy. I'd like to 10 if we could just book it right now. If we could just, you know, next Saturday night, they just pull out that number 10. Uh, Paul, nobody song. listens. I have the idea to make the, the prep races better and to make it more preferential is you should be able to pick your post in order of the point standings. So the top horses should be able to pick their yeah. post. If they did that, people would value points more instead of just trying to get points to get in. And then if you are one of those top ones, can you someone can do a wellness check trip. on Paul B? Do we know where Paul B lives? <laughs> uh, could we do a oh wellness my. check? I mean, yes. I don't want to call nine one one, but hey, we need to do a wellness though. check. He said 14th. You sure that's not your burner account, Paul, and you're not posting from <laughs> No, the not when he something? says that if it's a sloppy track, fastest <laughs> wins by the most lengths ever of a derby. I mean, I'm concerned for this person's wellness. I, I'm assuming he's being up. Okay. Don't call, don't, Pete, you're going to get off, right? Don't call 911, but can you call the, the business line of the Kansas City paramedics I'll and just, say, I'll do, we'll we do have a wellness reason to believe that you have someone in your constituency who might need a, a mental evaluation? Yeah. Could just be, right. he's, he's I'm just age kidding, By the way, I love the feedback, Paul. Don't take it seriously. Paul, we're just, I love we're just people having fun, man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It's all good. Pete, I'm going to let you go because I know yes, you got to get going. I got to go. And then we'll let Paul have his rant. Pete, thanks a lot. We'll be talking to you soon. Appreciate oh. the contribution tonight. All right, everybody. See you, fellas. Take care. See you, Pete. Bye-bye. All right, Paul. Uh, fun conversation. It's going to be really interesting, the Kentucky Derby pace situation. We got a, a lot of time to talk about it on many different shows. But, you know, we can't have a show without one particular thing, and that would be Paul's rant <laughs> of the week. Paul, I'm going to go off screen. What do you got tonight, sir? Well, it is going to be positive, but I, I am fired up about it, Howard. This is this signifies the absolute best time of the year coming for horse racing. Let's start with what happened today, Howard. Today is a very special day in horse racing that many of our listeners probably aren't even aware. The Oklahoma training track opened for business today at Saratoga. Day one of training, it will remain open through November. This to me is always a special day because that means that Saratoga is actually not that far off. They're training on the Oklahoma. The turf course at Laurel, now we don't talk about Laurel much, but you may know that Laurel is one of the best turf surfaces in the country. That opens tomorrow and happy to say that St. James the Great, whom I own a little piece of, a Catholic boy colt, will be running on that turf tomorrow. Keeneland, where we just got back from Howard, just one of the greatest places on earth. Five, five racing cards left at Keeneland. And then when Keeneland's done, we'll be only one week out from the Kentucky Derby. The Kentucky Derby post positions being done on Saturday this year. So all of us degenerates will have a full week with them instead of only five days. From the Derby, we go to the Preakness. And like him or not, Bob Baffert is back in play. He won't be playing in Kentucky because he had no shot of winning that case, uh, Zidane's case in Kentucky, but he will be in play for the Preakness, and he will be ready to take on our Sierra Leone in the Preakness. Then we go to the third leg of the Triple Crown, and we go back to Saratoga in what I think will be one of the busiest 
most bustling, exciting weekends in the history of Saratoga when everyone comes to town for the Belmont Stakes to be run there because of the project at Belmont. And then after the Belmont Stakes Festival at Saratoga, we only have one month until Saratoga and Delmar, the two premier race meetings of the year that run concurrently, and we get to bet all summer. We get to bet Saratoga, and then when the card's over, we get to bet Delmar. It's just a tremendous time of year, and that brings us to Labor Day, and we're only two months away from the Breeders' Cup, which are the best two days in racing for the real race players among us. So get excited, folks. It is truly the best time of the year. It's a great time of year. And you I, I don't believe you mentioned New York's opening their turf course this weekend. There's turf racing I, in New York as well. I am I, I was so excited course. about so excited about St. James the Great. I yes, know. Aqueduct Turf is in great shape. Uh, obviously has been run on all winter. Aqueduct turf in great shape opens on Saturday. They do, and Hawthorne's byway turf course will open Derby weekend. Oh, I forgot. the It's on my notes. The Illinois Derby Sunday. We should mention that. Yeah. I'm not saying it because we have Jim and he's a sponsor. I am a big fan of supporting these smaller tracks in general, but especially on their big days, whether it be Tampa Derby Day in Tampa. I don't care if it's yes. the – the uh, FanDuel, you know, the St. Louis Derby or whatever they call it at FanDuel, you know, these smaller tracks, uh, uh, the Haskell at Monmouth, I think, uh, and Monmouth's not really a small track, it's one level down, but I think that we all should support Hawthorne, uh, on, especially on their big day, especially what they've done with takeout, and uh, I certainly will be playing along on Sunday. I couldn't agree with you more, and in case you didn't hear that, the last thing I'll say for, uh, that Paul mentioned we should have mentioned at the beginning of the Kentucky Derby a pace analysis. The draw this year, folks, is on Saturday. They're running a card on Saturday, the Saturday before the Derby. And I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe it's between races three and four. We'll get more information on that. I think it's going to be around six, 7.15 Eastern, I believe, to 7.45 Eastern. That's what I recall hearing. It'll be the Derby and Oaks draw which we're going to have live right here on the HHH Racing Podcast. I believe it's between races three and four, the Saturday before the Derby. And, Paul, I got to say, I like that a lot because that means, number one, it's going to be a little bit quicker because it's between the races. And, number two, it gives people a lot more opportunity to look at the PPs, to talk about the race. That means the other races will be also drawn earlier, I would assume. So I think it's a great idea by Churchill Downs to do that. I'm very excited about that. Four. Oh, go ahead, Paul. You want to add something? No, I, I agree. No, I just think it, I think by Sunday, certainly by Sunday, we should have all PPs for both days, right? Yes. Uh, well, I hope is, so because uh, the next day is our big Derby preview uh, show. We're only they all the shows. The how it all the shows are running together? How it's going to be just, a round table. I go, look, how would I take this? One, I look at my calendar and I say, "Do I have an HHH show tonight?" And I know that for like the next two weeks. Pretty much the answer is yes. So I just uh, I just prepare that way. And I love it. You know I love it. I know. I know. You, you do love it. We all love it. Uh, it's been a great show. Really appreciate it. For my good friend and director of racing, Jim Miller, good friend and co-host, Pete Visco, and good friend and co-host, Paul Howard. This has been your host, Howard Kravitz, episode 348 of Picks and Ponies. Crush your bets at Hawthorne Racecourse. This Sunday. Take care, everyone. Have a great night. Bye bye. Good night. Podcast, you're missing out. It's one of the best podcasts in the country.